All right, we're at 12.03. Silas, if you want to turn the music off, that is awesome. And um, Adrian, if you want to hit record, I don't think we're doing that yet. Awesome. So we'll keep letting folks in. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Happy Wednesday and day of transgender visibility. Super excited that you guys are here. We actually have both employees from outside as well as folks from the industry. So those of you that don't know me, and I don't even know everybody yet from outside since we're one team kind of still coming together. My name is Sharon Houghton. I'm the vice president of sales here outside. Um, and we've been doing a few of these lunch and learns over the past several months at outside. And a lot of them have been just for our employees here, but we have also on occasion opened them up or we've done webinars. Some of you guys might've attended our um, inward conversation that we did a couple months ago. So we decided to open this one up. So welcome to all of you that are not part of our organization. We're super to have you here. We did decide to leave this more as a Zoom meeting versus a webinar, because we're hoping that as we get to the Q&A that it can be a little bit more intimate, a little bit more conversational versus the webinar, you get one person, it's all frozen. It's just very formal. So if you do need transcription, I just like to mention that on the bottom of the Zoom, you can hit live transcript and it will give you um, the transcription at the bottom of the screen. So um, do that if that's needed as well. Um, so I personally am super excited about today. I'm really excited to introduce Silas to you. Um, he and I actually go quite a ways back, 15 years, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, and we actually first met in Colorado Springs. Um, and I actually first met Silas when he was Sarah, which you're gonna hear a little bit about um, here shortly. And I actually forgot about this until last night, but I was thinking about, I, we worked together for a while, but I was thinking about when we actually first met and it was actually through the outdoors and more specifically around bikes. So my ex-husband at the time actually introduced me to Sarah at the time um, and they were both working at a bike shop and I was working at Carmichael Training Systems down in Colorado Springs. And Sarah at the time eventually started working with me at CTS, we became really fast friends um, that's actually also where he met his lovely wife, Erica, who you're going to hear a little bit about here shortly also. Um, and what's so funny when we first connected to talk about him speaking today, we were both laughing about how much has changed in the past 15 years. You know, life goes on, things change. Um, but two of which include the ex-husband of mine that introduced us is now a priest. True story. That's another conversation for another time. And Sarah is now Silas. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear Silas's story. He has such an inspirational one um, and he's excited to share it with you. So I'm going to pass it to you, Silas, and take it away. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. Can everybody hear me okay? Got we thumbs up. It's so good to see all your faces. Some are familiar, uh, others aren't. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, I, I'm going to actually use a, a presentation that, uh, you know, 1990s called and want their slide deck back, but I, um, I, I have some pictures that I think are going to help accompany this story today. So I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen as we get started. And, um, and I, I hope, you know, in spite of the fact that we're virtual, I hope that um, you're able to, to connect with this in a way that, um, that feels, that feels real. And, um, and I encourage folks to, to jump into the chat and to, um, feel like you can ask questions as we go along. Um, so today is an important day and, um, and part of the fact that we're doing this um, and you're having this conversation and you've opened up this platform for me to share my story um, is, is an answer to the call for transgender visibility. And, um, and I used to like, I used to underestimate the power of stories or, or my story in particular. And, um, and I've learned over the course of, of my life and my experiences that this really is important. It really is important to share stories. And so that's one of the things that I wanna contribute. Um, I, I want to say that I am sharing my story, that I do not speak for um, all transgender individuals. Um, a, lot, a lot of our stories have similar threads, but they are very unique to us. And so today I wanna, I wanna come as Silas and, uh, and share with you what, what my experience has been. Um, and this is so exciting. I've, I've given talks like this in other settings, but I've never gotten to make it all about the outdoors 
And so like I had so much fun and so much self-reflection and putting this all together. And so I just kind of want to drop in and uh, use this picture that my wife actually took on um, our last, my last 14 er climb with the family. Um, so this is looking at the Cresto needles and um, we're, we're coming down Humboldt. And, um, and I, and I want to use that to kind of orient you to my story. I, uh, I am the oldest child of a Southern Baptist preacher and his wife from Southwest Virginia. You'll hear the Southern accent coming out, fight it as I may. Uh, it's, it's, still, it's still there, it's still part of me. And, um, and I grew up as like a kind of rough and tumble uh, girl, biological female. And I, um, I didn't understand gender in a complex way at all. Like there were very clear gender roles in um, the, the space in which I grew up. And, you know, looking back now, like I, I was a tomboy and that's what we called it. And that was like how society kind of allows girls to be um, more masculine. And, and that was how I showed up. And I didn't think much of it because it wasn't, it wasn't too upsetting to the, the world around me. But as I've gone along, I, um, I've started to understand. And even after my transition, I am, I am a softer guy than I was a harsh kind of girl, if you will. And so I just wanna to try to like invite you to open your own thinking to the fluidity and uh, what, what we often stereotype and generalize is far more complex than that. And that's gonna show up in certain ways, but certainly that for me, that has been a, a big part of my journey. So um, that's, that's kind of context setting. For the sake of today, I want to. I'm going to start back in 2004. I was a college student at Liberty University, very uh, conservative, religious Christian university in Virginia. I was the only female on the mountain bike team. It was a small team at the time, and um, and I loved going out and just um, crushing it on the trails with all the guys, and. Um, the, the process of coming out as gay for me was very tumultuous and, and it was in a, a community where that was not embraced or accepted um, at all. And so I ended up in Colorado Springs to go to focus on the family and, um, and try to correct this gay behavior that was showing up in me. And at the time I, I really believed in, in a very different set of thoughts and ideologies. But um, after I got through Focus on the Family, I went right back to bikes and I became a mountain bike guide on Pikes Peak. And I started working in the bike shop, which is uh, what Shannon referenced. And then I started racing bikes and, um, and I, I put female in parentheses, which basically if you were to translate this, it's like Iron Man feet. Do you see what I did there? Um, and so I, I raised bikes and I searched for community. I searched and searched for community. And I know that all that time I was, um, I was in the process of identity creation and trying to find, like trying to fill spaces in my heart that I had lost and in my, um, in the world around me. And it was really important that, that this rebuild happened, but it was also, it bumped up against real personal struggle for me. Um, there's a, there's a break in the timeline of when I was mountain bike racing and during that break was the lowest point in my life. And it was a deep, dark depression that led to a, um, a severe suicide attempt. And my wife, um, bless, bless you, Erica. She's on this, uh, she's on this call, uh, literally saved my life. Um, she did CPR and, um, and, and that is a, a, like a story in and of itself. I ended up in the ICU and, um, and I have to lift up the mental health um, system because I spent that summer, um, the summer of 2010, I spent it in and out of a inpatient psychiatric unit. And it, they, that saved my life. My wife saved my life the day that I attempted. And then that system saved my life over the course of the following weeks and months because I um, I wasn't safe. Um, I wasn't well. And um, when I finally, finally got to a point where I could interact um, in society again, I started climbing 14ers. And, and some of that at the beginning was still me being a bit dangerous to myself. And 14ers were scary. I felt so numb inside that um, 
that I needed, I needed something that would make me feel. And it was a physical push in my body. It was, um, it was the wilderness. It was the extreme environments, the, um, the storms that could roll in, the, the trails that were exposed. It was all of those things that, that I needed in order to awaken myself and embrace living again. And so um, I, you know, I, the mountain, the mountains healed me, the outdoors, they, um, they allowed me to flourish again and to start to see life in, in color and 3D again. Um, so as I'm building community, as I'm going along, Colorado Springs, I love Colorado Springs community. And, um, and they created a lot of spaces for me to share my story and to open up and to start to like lean into advocacy work and, and looking at what it means to be queer and transgender in a society where that isn't a norm or, or common and that that's often attacked on you know, national and legislative levels. Um, and I, I shared this story in uh, 2018 with Oprah Magazine and my dear friend Kirsten wrote it um, and she held it so delicately and I, I uplift her as well. And, um, but sadly, the story was a pretty like heartbreaking story. It's a short read, but it's the loss of family. It's the struggle of depression and suicide. It's, it's mental illness. It's trying to find uh, myself. And it is absolutely representative of a lot of what queer folk, um, trans folk experience. Um, and, and so I, I did this really fun like exercise with myself of going back to my 14 er summits because I've told this story in other ways, but never like this before. And so there's 58 14ers in Colorado, uh, mountains over 14,000 feet. And, um, and they're super popular. Like people are, are on those mountains um, all summer long, as long as weather permits. Um, there's, there's like um, lines and lines of people on some of them. And so for me, the, the 14 years really was this very like personal thing. I wasn't, I, I didn't set out to do it and, and, and prove anything, but along the way, it really started to shape and, and correlate with what was happening um, to me uh, as a person. So I, I chose these five peaks. Every, every mountain has a story, but I chose these to kind of walk you through my journey. Red Cloud Peak was my second mountain. And the day before I did my first mountain, Wetterhorn. And this was actually while I, or right as I was finishing at Focus on the Family. And I did this climb with a couple of guys who um, were employees at Focus on the Family, like um, great, great people. And um, at that point, like I was struggling with my gay identity and trying to suppress it and having a very hard time with that. Fast forward to 2010, this is right after I got out of um, the, the psych ward, the, the inpatient unit that I was in. I had shaved my head. I, um, I, I was really struggling with my uh, mental health and well-being. And I did a bunch of clients that summer. And, um, and I went, some of them I soloed, some of them were with friends, new friends, old friends. Um, and then like a lot of mountains between 2010 and 2016, um, I chose this summit. It wasn't like the most exciting summit, but this is the last mountain I did as Sarah, which um, was my former name. Um, and I, I do wanna point out that um, some trans folk, uh, maybe even a lot of trans folk don't want to be referred to as their former name. I, for me, it's very hard to tell my story and not do that. And, and Sarah is a part of, um, a, a part of what got me here. I even say that she did 37, Silas did 21. She did more work and the guy got the credit. It's like total social mayhem right there. Um, but I, um, this was the last mountain I did as Sarah. And I, my best friend is standing there, Matt Payne. Uh, Matt Payne for photography, hopefully you've heard of it. Um, that's an inside joke. Um, Matt Payne and I, and we talked that weekend about being trans. And I was like, I don't think I am. I think within a week of this climb, I changed my name. Um, and I had been wallowing with this on a private level for a, for sure a year, very seriously. And, and I think I'd been in a bit of like fog of denial prior to that. 
um, because I, my wife and I were a very proud lesbian couple and we showed up that way. We were out and, um, and shared a lot. And so for me to, to change our identity was a, a very big step. Um, fast forward to uh, 2018, mountain number 46. So in January of 2018, I had top surgery, uh, a double mastectomy. And this was literally a month, maybe like shy by a day since I had had that surgery. And this, we did this in February and it was so cold. Um, and it's so cold that right after my friend Truman took this photo, his phone died because it like got too cold, but I like had to, I had to take my shirt off and, um, and like celebrate the fact that I was coming into myself. And, um, so on a, another quite, you know, unimpressive peak, there is a big, big moment for me. And I got to do that with some new friends and then, uh, Truman, who was already a, a friend of mine. And then, I, and then, of course, my finisher, it happened last summer, and um, my family, my, my daughter, who was six at the time, who this morning told me, don't be nervous, Dad, just tell them about the best day of your life, which is when I was born. <laughs> and so my daughter, she did every step of that summit, um, our, my stepson, Jack, um, who basically has had to experience his puberty along with my trans puberty, um, bless him as well. Um, my dear wife, Erica, and, and then my best friend, Matt, and his son, Quinn. And it was my last 14er, and it was Quinn's first 14er. And like, again, I could go through 58 stories like this, but to, to just show you what the, the experience of summiting these mountains meant for me is, um, it, it's just, it's really telling because it really syncs up with my own um, gender transition and, um, and journey. All right. So over the next four slides, and I want you to hang with me, I want to make it about a little bit more than me. Um, I had the, the honor and privilege of, of doing a, a research thesis in my master's degree, a communication degree that looked at gender and leadership. And I want to share this because it was, it was very important in my own journey to acknowledge that this, this act, there are things that ripple across the trans community and show up. And I think this is how I pivot to what can you be doing individually in your organizations and, and as a broader society. So I'm gonna like, this is a big overview, but I'm gonna introduce you to a, a leadership style that I encourage anybody, whether you are um, cisgender, meaning your gender aligns with how you show up and were born in, as far as gender goes, whether you're transgender, whether you're non-binary, um, no matter what, like these principles can apply and, and I, the research is showing that they can be pretty effective. So an androgynous leader um, uses both feminine and masculine leadership styles. And, and in my research, I look at that as feminine as relational and masculine as task oriented. And an androgynous leader will take a scenario and say, I'm gonna to choose to be relational right now because that is gonna be more effective, or I'm gonna to choose to be task oriented because that will be more effective. And so in my study, I interviewed three, uh, well, six transgender leaders. Um, three had transitioned male to female, three female to male. Um, their ages ranged, ranged from 27 to 51. They were in different sectors of work. They had held leadership roles for various periods of time. Um, they had also publicly transitioned um, the, the least amount of time was two years up to six years. All of them had transitioned as adults though, which is really important because we're seeing more and more youth transitioning as this becomes um, more noticeable and acceptable in society. We're seeing that um, transgender individuals are transitioning earlier. Um, so the, the research I did um, over eight hours of interviews, 100, 20 pages of transcripts. And then I analyzed to kind of, to ask these leaders um, how they thought, and I didn't use androgynous leadership necessarily as a term, but how they felt relationally or task oriented. And, um, and then I took the, the findings and, and drew the key findings out. So if anybody really wants to look deeper into the study, 
Um, it's, uh, it's held on uh, UCCS, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs website. Um, androgynous leadership style is performed by queer leaders. I'm happy to share it with you. But what, what is important for here and the takeaway that, that I wanna un uplift at this platform is um, the, these findings. And then I'm gonna connect them into how it might look in your daily and work life. Um, all of the all of the leaders mentioned use of past gender knowledge, uh, and what that means is I I was socialized as female in this society and in the majority of my life. I was in my mid thirties when I transitioned, and so all of my knowledge and reference points are when I was a female and when I was being like referred to or um, embraced into female spaces. So I naturally, if, if you ask me something, I naturally will often re reference um, a scenario where I was a female at the time. Um, the, the findings also showed, and this was true for my participants as well, um, the findings show that they're highly self-aware and highly contextual. And so these are, these are important in the sense, sometimes the self-awareness can be paralyzing because um, you want to overthink everything or how folks are reading you or how you're being perceived. Um, and so, but the self-awareness can also mean that there's a real, a real depth of, of empathy and understanding about what's going on because of it. And then the contextual piece really showed up when we're looking at um, whether you choose to be relational or task oriented, that context was more natural for these transgender leaders. Um, as I said at the beginning, numerous unique experiences. There's no one trans um, story, there are numerous and, it, and it's, it is different for each individual. And you have to imagine how many different contexts, families, cultures, backgrounds, individuals come from and how that shows up. Intersectionality is a huge piece. The direction of one's transition, um, race, um, ability, all of those other things are, are very uh, telling pieces that make for these unique stories. And so I, like, I encourage that we get away from the stereotypes and generalizations and try to embrace the uniqueness um, and the richness that show up in each individual. Um, physicality absolutely came up. Um, being transgender is a very physical embodied experience. How we show up in the world is very physical. Uh, my joke, and so far I haven't gotten tired of it, is the only time I have big hands is on Zoom and the rest of the time I have like pretty <clears throat> proportionally small hands. Um, and again, like the physicality piece really showed up for me through, um, through athletics, through sport, through um, through chasing 14 or summits and, and physicality is, uh, for many transgender individuals is something that, that we battle with because we feel a, a dysphoria in our bodies. We feel a disconnection from our bodies and how we, um, how we are wired or, or perceive ourselves. And so, um, physicality is a, is a very fundamental piece of it. Disruption of self and surroundings. I think this is why like queer folks want to come in and like shake things up. Um, and disruption isn't always a bad thing. Disruption can all often be the thing that changes a norm or a, 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 whether it's like a cultural norm within an organization, whether it's a social norm. Um, so disruption can be that, that questioning of why are we doing something the way we're doing it. Code switching is another thing that showed up a lot. Code switching is something we all do, but trans folk will often do it in, um, and this is what the research showed, that they'll do it in a way that um, situates them naturally in their environment. And, and that leads right into the, the next point, which is self-preservation and self-regulation. Um, so last night I was digging around on Outside's website, trying to see what you all were actually up to. And I, I came across the Venture Out video and I watched it. And it's, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's really, really good. Um, and it's a, a group of a queer folk who are doing um, um, backpacking trips for a queer community. And there's a point where they're all at camp in the mountains and they're talking about, yeah, like I've, I've been, this is just a hypothetical. I, I've been uh, transgender for eight years, and yet 
whenever someone asks me a question, I can't really reference it without outing myself. And so they'll, they'll regulate, they'll, they will preserve <laughs> um, their identity and not share something. And so like in this space, this queer space that they had created, um, there was this, this natural sharing and flowing and they didn't have to guard themselves at all. And I think that our goal is that folks will feel, that queer folk will feel that, that kind of safeness in our organizations, in our outdoor spaces, and, and not have to self-preserve or self-regulate, that, that, they, that they can feel safe to share openly, which leads to the, the role of accepting spaces. Oh, you've done so good. You made it through the research part. Um, <laughs> So I, I spent, I'm a parent, I spent a lot of time late at night, like watching a documentary while doing something else work related. And once the, the family has gone to bed and I was watching this documentary, um, this harkens back to uh, 2006, Dean Carnassus did 50 marathons in 50 days uh, in 50 states. And I'd never actually watched the documentary, even though I was at Carmichael Training Systems when they were supporting the run. And so I was kind of watching it, doing other things. And he, Dean gets to the 49th marathon start. And at this point, like, I, you can only imagine what, what he feels like mentally, physically. Um, and he said this statement and I like literally paused the, paused the documentary and wrote it down. And I'll, I'll read it to you. It says, there's so many things that divide people in the world. And when I set out to do this, this is Dean talking about the 50 marathons. Um, I said, I don't want this to be about one guy out there trying to prove something. I want it to be about inclusion and uniting people. And like, that really resonated with me in thinking about my own story and in thinking about like, why am I sharing what I'm sharing? Um, I'm gonna share a, a two minute video. This is never before seen footage of, <laughs> I don't even know if my wife has seen this, of me doing this selfie video as I was coming down from a 14er that I had soloed. And I actually was really struggling uh, when I did this hike and, I, and I'll let the video speak for itself. Hopefully you can hear it. Hey, Silas here. In the forest and Silas means of the forest. So all the things are aligned, except that, <laughs> I have this rub obscuring the view. Um, <laughs> I'm extra excited when that is not a thing anymore. I also decided that I don't care what my scars look like or how weird my nipples end up. I am going to be so proud of my chest. I think that I'll probably go topless to business meetings, places where it says on the door, Shirts, shoes required. They don't have to give me service. I just want to go in there. Topless. All silliness aside, I am a week and a half into the name change. And I suspected it would be a big deal. And it was still more than I expected. No hormones pumping through my system yet. No alterations to my physical body. Not even too many push-ups, to be honest. Um, but huge mental shifts. And then conveying that to the world in my own way, to my world, it's been a really big deal. And um, challenging, but way, way, way better than challenging and you guys rock and you love really hard and without conditions and I appreciate you. Check it out here. I'm certain this video doesn't do justice but Thanks for thanks for uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. <laughs> thanks for uh, rooting for me, or not saying so if you're not. I guess keep your mouth shut. Hey, Silas here. Okay, there we go. Um, 
so I, so I'm going to stop screen sharing for just a second and say like, that's kind of embarrassing to share. And yet like it, it tells its own story, you know, and, and I look back at that and I can be so critical of like the person that took that video, but there's a purity about the process and there's a, I don't know, there's, there's something special about it. And I think that's what, like, when I think about trans day of visibility, you know, nobody passed me on the trail that day knew what I was going through. And, and one of the things that, that in all of my interviews of other transgender individuals, it was, it was the response they got when they first came out that like, it would, it would just like take the, the, the air out of the room because they were just waiting for what that response was going to be. And if it was a good response, then, oh, it was so, uh, it was so encouraging and empowering. And if it was a negative response, it was so easy to want to just retract everything and go right back into hiding. And I think that's where we all play this role because we don't know where individuals are in their, in their journeys. And, um, and so there, there's something really, there's something really special about about sharing that, and then seeing how, <laughs> how far I've come in in my own transition, in my own physical transition, in my own personal growth. Like I actually feel like I have a a, a more groundedness and a, a a peacefulness about myself that I didn't have as that person. Um, so I want to I want to move now from um, from that into looking at. Um, social norms and then our organizations. And you know, like one of the things I want you to be able to leave today, and I, I'm paying attention to the time because I want us to have some Q&A, but um, I want you to have some ideas of things that you can do as an individual, as a manager, as an organization leader, um, as a, um, you know, a leader in the, the space that you're in. So, um, so we'll switch gears to that, if I can. Or you'll see in my screen. Um, it's escape or double click to exit full screen mode. Maybe you need to go to the next slide. Yeah, hang on. There we go. Now just share it. Yeah, that's perfect. We're good. Yeah. So the um, so the the day I Facebook came out, which we all know, like that's sort of like that's the biggest coming out that you have. Um, I got so many messages from friends, and this is when I said, "Hey, call me Silas, he him pronouns," and like people sent screenshots of how they had updated their contact in their phone, and I um when I look back and I'll, I'll go ahead and go to the next slide. When I, when I came out as gay, I was in a space where that was not acceptable and it was very, very painful and hard coming out process. But I had, you know, there's 15, 15 years between these two pictures. And when I came out as Silas, I had spent, you know, over a decade creating a community of people that I love and trusted and, and I could share my full self with in this way. And so my trans coming out was like actually smooth and much easier than my gay coming out. And, and, and so I just want to acknowledge that when there is social acceptance that is willing to push aside social norms, then, then the, the process can be so much easier. And like that literally saves lives. Because when those processes are are not welcoming and not safe, then then it is like mental um, like depression and, and other things will quickly flood in. Um, I I put this picture of my my first trail. I've only I've only entered one trail race as or, or one race as a guy. Um, I have another one coming up in a few weeks, and <laughs> like it's horrifying because I'm like, okay, I have to have a plan for if I need to pee, like because I can't, like I will make a mess if I try to stand and pee by the trail. Like there, like there are ways in which this shows up, and you just you like, okay, just act cool, act like don't say anything, don't like don't make any big movements, don't draw attention to yourself, and then at the end of the race, of course, I go take my topless selfie just because I'm so proud of my little self, but. Um, I mean, again, I'm sharing the story because it, it shows up differently for all of us. And if we can just accept one another in our differences and embrace that and, and celebrate that, I think that the, the welcoming environments will naturally um, show up. One of my favorite speakers when I do a lot of 
personal work around racial equity because I am a white person in this world and I have a lot to learn because I don't have the experiences of people of color. So it's my job to learn those things and to, to catch up. Um, and I have a lot of understanding for folks who are learning about gender because I do know what that feels like and my experiences inform it. Um, but John Powell, uh, he does a ton of work around racial justice and he says that structures say if people belong or not. And that the opposite of othering is not saming. We're not trying to all be the same, but belonging. And, um, and Outside Magazine, I've been uh, reading through some of your diversity work and you, you refer to belonging, your, your spaces for belonging. And that is exactly what we're going for here. Um, I'm gonna give a few examples and none of these are gonna be mind blowing at all. And you're gonna be like, I want my money back, except this is free. So there, just listen. Um, the, the way in which we can start to shift culture is, I think, starts at an individual level. And then a, there's a, another level, which is institutional or organizational, and then society. And a lot of these recommendations, they, there's a role in each of those levels. Um, I got to give Can Canada credit for this. Um, very nice. In their terms, they would say washroom. They did actually say restroom on this one, but they're very inclusive bathroom sign. Now, right now, a lot of us are working remotely. And so we have the luxury of our own very accepting bathrooms, which is great. But, you know, when we are in our public spaces again, how, how willing are we to, um, to inform, to, to, incorporate uh, gender, all gender restrooms, um, non-gender restrooms. Um, it's actually, it's, it's only as hard as we make it. It can be as simple as putting a, a paper sign over the, um, the sign that is, is there physically. And this stuff's important and we've been talking about it and we shouldn't be uh, afraid of one another, um, but we should all feel safe uh, in, in these settings. Um, another example, and I love this as a comm major, um, is <laughs> when the ways in which we communicate with each other become more inclusive. So I am a proponent of emojis. I love emojis. I will throw them everywhere I can. And, you know, when they added the non-gender emoji to, to each of the other uh, binary female male emojis, that's my go-to every time. Like, I, uh, I connect with that and I feel represented by it. They recently, in one of the most recent updates, and this is Apple specific, I, I apologize to the droids out there, um, but your, yours looks sim similar. Um, but when they added the transgender flag, it was like, yes, thank you. Like that's like, that's just another step of visibility and, and representation. And it's simple and, and being, be, being able to use those things and how they show up as well. Um, I, this is some of the recommendations that at a high level, I think um, organizations should be doing. Um, and simple stuff, but also you have to be intentional. So non-gendered language, you guys, like we all say it, it seems like. So what, how can we replace that with everyone? I've even like started resorting to y'all. I'm from the South and I was trying to like hide my Southernness, but I'm like, you know, y'all is better than, than a gendered version um, of, of that like term. Um, adding pronouns to your, um, to your email signatures, to your Zoom links, um, to your meetings, like using those when you introduce one another. If you're in a, a physical retail space, adding that to your name tags. Um, a simple thing that just immediately says, I see you, you're included, um, and, um, and, and it really does create um, a sense of um, welcoming space for queer folks and, and those of us who uh, our, our pronouns are a big piece of our um, of our journey. Uh, HR policies and um, systems and forms, like that's more I think at the institutional level. Um, the the don't assume heteronormativity. Like there are a lot of the reason we use the term queer is because there it's an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of things that are about sexuality and gender, and so heteronormativity is basically saying that only male and female couples exist in our society, which is not the case. And we know that. And so trying to get away from, from places where it just shows up that it's assumed that, 
you know, that I have a wife or you have a husband or, or, or however that might look. So, you know, starting to open ourselves up to the fact that there are very, there are a lot of variations. And then also the not assuming that gender is fixed you know, our youth are doing a better and better job of this and, and going with the flow of, uh, of gender not being a set thing or, um, you know, or male and female only. Um, other things that I recommend, and the, the don't assume pieces start with the individual, but they can be institutionalized as well. Um, creating inclusivity teams, creating affinity groups. Um, I think that there is a balance between um, having our own queer spaces that are just for us, but then also being welcome into the broader space. And so affinity groups are gonna be where queer folk go to be with queer folk on purpose because, because we connect around this thing, uh, this, this thing of queerness. But then, you know, how are uh, inclusivity teams creating spaces where everyone is, is welcome and acknowledged and accepted? Um, surveys of employees and your followings and then actually implementing the feedback and naming it are some examples. Um, and then educating yourself like podcasts, queer media, documentaries, books, articles. I really want to um, encourage local LGBTQ organizations because I I'm a big proponent of the work at the at the local level. And no matter where you live, you're going to be able to find um, groups that are that are doing this work that are seeking community support and you can be a part of that in your personal life as well. Um, and then I want to give a shout out, and I didn't run this by anybody, including Sharon, but I want to give a shout out to, to Outside um, Business Journal, Outside Magazine, the, um, the parent company. But I just went on my own time in the late hours of the night, and I said, what is Outside doing? And these are some of the things I found that nobody told me. I just found them um, on your site. So the 2021 diversity goals. Um, the, the tagging system in your articles for DEI and then also spelling it out, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, uplifting queer stories. And they're easy to find because of the tagging system. Like I went on and, and watched and read about the Venture Outside effort. It was so good. You should check it out. Um, you all have a DEI committee with subcommittees that have goals and they're like, they're like there, you can find them, you can read about them. Um, taking staff time to do implicit bias courses that are required. Like that's, um, that's a bold step. Engagement surveys. And I don't know how those are being implemented, but they're happening. So that's really good. And so I like, I am a person that loves to celebrate what we're doing right rather than really grind on what we're getting wrong, because I think that, that that's where, um, you know, that's where we can really, um, build on the the improvement you know and maybe it's it's just my personal approach but if you tell me I'm doing something good I do it better and if you tell me I'm doing something bad I go and pout for a, a little while I'm sorry Erica um so outside magazine like outside uh, is is already doing some of this work and setting a standard as a leader um and and like this this is so important in every sector and in every industry and in every space and so I am I was thrilled to be invited to come and talk today um I haven't gotten to do this in the outdoor space in a long time and it was like uh, coming back in a way and um, so thank you for that. I know that we're gonna we're gonna spend a little time on questions. I haven't given us a ton of time, but um, here's some of the ways to reach me, or you can reach out to um, any of the folks that helped organize this. And um, and I am always up for a conversation, or 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 whatever that might look like for um, you in your personal or or organizational space. Awesome. Thanks, Silas. That was so good. I didn't even know some of that. So that was really fun. <laughs> go back and watch your journey. So I had chills. Thank you. Um, and just so connected to the outdoors too, right? Like I think, again, not everybody's journey is, but that's what we do here at Outside and um, the industry at large. So really fun to see how that was therapeutic to your journey. So we're going to open it up for questions. Um, feel free anybody to chime in either verbally. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat, just lots of love um, from some of your friends and our employees. So you'll have to take a chance to read read those because that's been fun to watch. Um, any questions from the peanut gallery? I know there's some out there. We'll give people a minute. I have a question. Yeah. Um, specifically because I, I work in media and a, a lot of the people on this call work in media. 
are there recommendations that you would give to cis journalists covering trans issues and how they can do it responsibly? Yeah, so the fact that you're asking the question is like, I, I think that is what you want to model. Um, for me personally, a big piece of it is how do you want us to use your, so <laughs> this is almost like the grammar issue with they pronouns, like, oh my, what, like we can't, yeah, you, we can break a grammar rule, it's okay, if it's gonna like accept, it's, if it's gonna make a person feel accepted and it's gonna upset society a little. Um, for me, it's been nice when um, referring to my past self being asked like, do you want me to use female pronouns since that, you know, is contextual at the time and letting me decide what I'm comfortable with. Um, and, and again, like a lot of trans folk feel very firmly about like the, the dead name, dead self stuff and, and not wanting to be referred to in that way at all. And I think that to honor that and to let that be a personal decision, um, that's, I mean, that's the big thing that comes up for me. There's probably more nuanced ways. I, for me though, also when I share my story, just having a level of trust and acceptance in the exchange of because it's vulnerable to share one story, especially certain parts of it. And uh, being able to trust that that's not just gonna be presented in a way that I didn't share it. I know that we don't always get to um, see the, the, final, um, the final work before it's published. Um, and I understand you know, the, the fact checking. And, and but, so just having as trusted a process back and forth um, really, really makes the, um, the, the publicity around the, the personal story easier. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, the fact that you're acting, asking the question is that you're already, you're, you're there, your heart is there. Um, yeah. yeah, that's great, thank you. I have a quick question that came in over um, the chat. So you mentioned a couple of books that can help us understand more about inclusivity and understanding which can you recommend? So I don't know if you wanna recommend some here or feel free, Silas, you can always email them to me and I can share with the team too. Although I'm not sure if Ben is um, maybe external, so. Yeah, we, um, <laughs> I have some really um, very queer books. One, oh, one is right here. <sighs> I recommend Fear of a Queer Planet. That's a good one. Um, the, and I'm, I'm happy to share some others. And I, you know what, like for any of this, you can Google search any topic and there is gonna be a top 10 list of recommended um, media. Like there's some really good, I don't know the link right offhand, there's a really good um, queer representation in media um, article right now where you know, it says like, if you're watching Netflix, these, these um, films or series have really good queer representation. And so like a lot of that is just a little bit of personal legwork. Um, and if that was been my neighbor, I'll just toss this over the fence to you. And if it wasn't, then um, we'll order you a copy of something. But um, the there like, thankfully due to the, a lot of work nationally and locally and state levels, there's great resources at our fingertips. Um, Go Google that. I'm kidding. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I have a quick comment and a quick question. Um, hi, Silas. My name is Kristen Hostetter. I'm the editor of Outside Business Journal, she, her. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. It was incredible. Um, and I have a question and feel free not to answer this if, if it's not comfortable, but you mentioned a few times going back to Colorado Springs. And I think you said something like to do do some family work, and I'm just wondering: Are you, are you, are you in touch and and um, uh, and on good terms and everything with your your family? Um, where does that stand? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a question I get a lot. I um, I know my family loves me, but I don't have a relationship with them, and um, hardly hardly interact at all. Um, and that's been really, really painful part of the process. And I think that that absolutely was um, a huge component of, you know, the, the valley of my life. Um, but the redemptive part is that I got married, even though people said I wouldn't have a long-term relationship. 
um, we, we created a family together, um, in spite of people saying that like gay people can't have families. And, um, and so like, I, like, I don't, I work very hard to not, um, overly grieve the loss of my biological family, um, because of the presence of my current family and, and what we have created. Um, and, you know, like religion has played a, a role in this and, and belief systems and politics and, and so many things. Um, and so for me, it's actually been healthier to, to distance myself. Um, um, so the answer is no, I don't, I don't have a, um, a close relationship with my family. And I envy, I envy queer folks who do, and there are plenty who do. I've spoken at uh, PFLAG meetings and I'm like, you are the parents that I don't like because you're all supporting your children so well. Um, but, um, but I know that my family loves me and, uh, and that they do it in their, in their way. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we have a question on chat. Do you have practical tips or recommendations for restroom inclusivity when an organization's building has two traditional group restroom facilities and not single occupancy restrooms? Any tips on what can be a challenging culture change? Yeah, so I, I, this is actually a little harder than, than we wanna make it. I was on a trails and working space committee and we were talking about building like, like spending millions of dollars to build bathrooms of Garden of the Gods. And it was like a huge question of like, you know, are we ready to go into a, a non-gendered space in addition to spending millions of dollars on bathrooms? Um, I mean, at every queer accepting conference I've ever been to, it was simply a sign stating um, the, these are open to anyone of any identity. Um, but having like individual stalls is what makes that work. Um, uh, the, I, I, my biggest, here's my rant. My biggest rant is being at a, a bar or brewery and needing to pee really badly and waiting on that one stall in the men's room. And I don't know what the guy in front of me is doing, but it takes way too long and all. I, and so I just want to sneak into the other bathroom really fast. Cause it's not even going to take, you know, um, one of the best ways I've seen this done was at a Unitarian church in Denver. And like it literally you walk in and it's almost like an airport restroom where there's stalls on, on either side. Everything is very private and closed off, like gender. And there's a mix of, of everyone of all ages. And, and then you all come out and wash your hands in the same spot. And so the only, you know, the only place, like granted COVID has changed everything, but the only place where you're interacting with the other sex, if you will, or, um, or folks who you don't generally go to the bathroom with were, were when you were washing your hands. Um, but if you are confined to a, you know, gender um, binary bathroom situation, which most buildings have, I think it, you know, it can become a project of that inclusivity team to say, you know, what are we willing to do? How are we going to introduce that? How are we going to monitor people's feedback? Like what? And so that's where a lot of this is very unique to your situation and having a team that's focused on that for you. Um, I think there are recommendations, but not like it can get real specific. Um, I mean, if, if your, your office culture is comfortable with putting signs up that say this bathroom is open to anyone, or you do that in one section of the building and then you leave the standard uh, binary bathrooms in the other section of the building, like that's a compromise as well. Um, I mean, this is coming up in schools a lot. Uh, it comes up in workplaces. Um, I mean, I love, I love restaurants who already are on top of that, but it's not the case everywhere. So. Okay, so I've got another question um, and feel free if it's too personal not to answer it, but curious whether you have any current religious beliefs since you mentioned being raised Southern Baptist that I'm a fellow Southern Baptist raised as well. And um, that's been changed over my life, um, but you've obviously had a very different journey. So curious if you feel comfortable talking about that. Yeah. Um, I feel comfortable talking about everything. This is fine. And <clears throat> I I am a spiritual person and I learned a few years ago that there was a huge difference between religion and spirituality. And I was thankful to learn that because I thought that, you know, with, with the loss of religion, you know, I had lost a part of myself. Um, I get major anxiety, PTSD anxiety in a church building. And I, so I don't go there and I, um, but I have, dear friends who are, uh, who are Christian and show up in a way that is gentle and loving and accepting. Um, and I can hear them out and I can, um, I can feel harmony around that. 
but for me, it's been more about meditation. It's been more about um, like the mountains um, are a place where I find and exercise my spirituality. Um, but like formal religion isn't something I am a part of anymore. And, you know, and if my kids decide that they want to be, I, I want, I, <laughs> I determine to be supportive because I know what that can feel like too. So um, yeah, that's my. Thank you. <laughs> Hi Silas, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the, your perspective on the use of the term queer. We know that sort of in older generations, it has tended to be uh, deemed sort of a derogatory term. And then the younger generations have utilized it sort of as, as like taking back the term and giving power to it in a positive way. And also second on that, um, your uh, suggestions for how the media handles the term. So those of us in media here, yes. how we use it. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel like you really answered the question. You answered the question in the question. Um, it is absolutely for, you know, a few generations ago, it was a horrible derogatory term that was used in painful, awful ways. And, um, and I acknowledge that and it isn't comfortable for everyone. And um, however, through education and younger generations, the, it, is, um, it is almost like a statement in and of itself that, that we are gonna reclaim this and recreate it and repurpose it for a very different um, outcome. And I love the term queer. And it wasn't always a term that I used. Um, I, like, I struggled calling myself a lesbian. Like labels, I hate labels and yet here we are and this is how we communicate. But you know, like once I did start to understand why um, the queer community was calling itself the queer community and how it really was just this massive group hug of, of so many different parts um, that I was like, oh yeah, I, I, I am part of that circle and I want to be. So I love that it's getting used. I, I think that it's important that we do define and acknowledge what it was, but that it doesn't have to continue to be that, nor is that how we want it to be used now. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's good progress and, and movement forward, but acknowledging the history. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. We're kind of coming up on time. Is there one more question? If somebody has one, I more. got one. All right. Hey Silas. Good to see you. All right. What, what's the next big adventure? Like you did all the 14ers. So what's the next big outdoor thing that you're going to do? Oh, that's awesome. Well, so I feel like I have to like rectify maybe some misinformation in the um, the promotion of this that I'm an ultra runner because technically I my first ultra run is on my 39th birthday, May 8th. Send me birthday wishes. Actually send me like fresh leg wishes. I'm gonna run my first 50K um, here in Colorado. And like my longest run is 22 miles and that was like two days ago, but I'm walking, so that's good. Um, and I don't know, like I really want to, I wanna go play with the, the family out uh, on the 14ers. I got really like laser focused and selfish about the 14ers when I started seeing the end in sight. And now I would like to like recreate and re-experience that um, backpack with the family and go to some places that um, as, a, as a group and not just me. So um, that's on the horizon, yeah. We have lots of backpacking recommendations and tips and pros here at Outside and Backpacker Magazine. So let us know how we can help or hook you up. Sweet. Um, all right, well, we are right over one o'clock. Thank you everybody. This was so <laughs> fantastic in so many ways. I just wanna give you a huge hug, <laughs> Silas. Mm -hmm. uh, thank so you. thank you. I think you guys got his contact information. If you didn't and you need it, reach out to those of us here outside. We'll get it to you. Um, and hopefully this won't be the last time that we can connect. Thanks for all the love. This is great. Thanks, Silas. Thanks, Silas. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you, Silas. Thanks, Silas.